if anyone's got any particular questions for any of the speakers that we haven't managed to answer, um, do drop us a line and we will pass them on if they're not able to hang around or if you're not able to hang around. Well, I can see an actual hand up in, uh, I think, in one of the videos. Lawrence, is that an actual hand up or? No, OK, it was just a bye. It was just a wave. OK, fine. Uh, <laughs> this is just like it happens in lectures. Um, and with children, the, the, are you stretching yeah, or? <laughs> yeah, one of the best stories I've heard was someone who had like clicked on the, the hand up uh, thing in a Zoom call um, and the lecturer was like, oh, do you have a question? And the student went, oh, no, sorry, I was just stretching. <laughs> <laughs> just a fantastic use of technology enjoy it very much good cool so were there any more uh, questions in the chat kevin that we might want to address before we um there was, there was some chat about um does GeoGebra or Desmos or something have like a scripting sort of thing or a macros like Excel? And I think we should talk briefly for anyone who is sticking around about what Philip and Christian have mentioned if you're not into coding or not yet into coding, I should say, um, in, a, in a programming language, then, then getting started in Desmos or Jojo or, or some other dynamic geometry thing is a really good way to get a handle on how a coding sort of thing might work without actually having to type commands. Although both of them, when you get used to them, do respond quite well to typing the commands and they sort of bridge that gap into coding. And the, in answer to the specific question, anything you can do in Excel, pretty much you can do in Jojo, for example. Not quite true in Desmos, but macros and all sorts of crazy scripting things are totally possible in Jojo if you want to go down that rabbit hole. I'm going to add in something that Alison said in the chat here, which is particularly pertinent. And, and I know this is something that puts me off. Um, they've said, I know I said something similar last week about making videos, but I think it deserves saying again, just because some people make very amazing and shiny things doesn't mean there isn't also a place for quick and dirty thrown together in GeoGebra or Absolutely. any of the other languages. Um, you should never be put off from getting stuck in and creating, which is, I think, particularly personal. I mean, it's what puts me off because I don't know how to do it and I think I won't do it very well. So I don't. Yeah, I mean, there's the sort of bearing in mind, there's only one way to get better and aiming at shiny things is, is a useful thing, but it can be off putting. So don't be afraid to make non shiny things because the shininess takes pff, bloody ages. <laughs> One more thing I wanted to share regarding Desmos um, is obviously everyone knows the graphing calculator and you can do many things on top of that. But Desmos does also have a teacher dashboard. Um, and yeah. I'm just going to share a link. We can, we can try this out. This is one of the built-in activities I, I found on their website. Um, but uh, you can create these links, share them with students. And then I'm also going to share my screen with the teacher dashboard um, where uh, you can create all of these different activities um, in a sequence, uh, which you can share with students. And then you can ask students to, uh, to submit responses and you can see all of the different students' responses on your dashboard. Um, so here's, I think, a sort of optics um, uh, activity. And you can, um, you can share specific students' responses anonymously with the entire class and then talk about them or you can ask students to comment on each other's responses. So this can help make uh, the whole flow a lot more interactive and you can in real time see what students are doing. I think that's really worth celebrating. Desmos is almost unique in its activity builder and sharer. And I mean, th there's a huge resource waiting to be used in exactly this lockdown situation, which is I think being noticed possibly for the first time among a whole generation of teachers. But Philip's right to point that out, it is super, flexible and super appropriate in this sort of remote teaching time. That's something that, for example, uh, Autograph and Jojoba don't do. Um, but then, you know, so every, every tool has its pros and cons. Is it, do people want to see uh, how to put an online activity into, into Jojoba's own hosting thing? Um, or is that something which is grandmothers and sucking eggs? Saying yes, yes. You've got, you got three yes, yes please. You're getting a lot of yeses here. I'll do, I'll do it very quickly. I don't want to hog any time here, but let me share a, this is what a Jojo window looks like when you just boot up Jojo. Uh, this is, I hope, just a, uh, a relatively familiar looking window and it does graphing things. You can draw lines and it has equations and what have you. But if you save that, um, 
first of all, it's dynamic. I don't want to go onto Jojo Dem, but if you save it as a Jojo profile, just clicking save, then there is on the website a place where you can upload it. If you sign into the Jojo website, you can have your own little store. Now you do not have to make it public, which is quite crucial, but you can, once it's up there, then embed it. So let me share a different screen to show you what that looks like. Uh, let's do the whole monitor so you can see what's going on. Um, so there is a, a Jojo web page. I hope you're seeing that. Okay, give me a nod if you are. Just checking that people have seen that. This is what it looks like when you go to Jojo, except that I'm signed in. So if you don't have a free Jojo account, sign in. That's the standard thing to do on a website, including Mathicon, I hear. You can uh, log in. Uh, good. Uh, but once you've got a, a sign in, you, you can access the classroom resources. You can actually access that without signing in. And there's literally millions of resources other people have made. But crucially, there is then a mine tab. And so resources you make you can be saved up here and you can make them public or only shared with a link or completely private so no one else can access them and once they're on there you can embed them or just share the link so here's one um that's just straight out of a uh, an mei fp2 textbook question genuinely this is what the question had a picture of but the crucial thing once it's online uh you can full screen it and have actually a nice clean presentation that's sort of doing some of the shiny presentation for you it's like removed all the distractions so once a file is uploaded you can do this with it and it's interactive or animated and the tick boxes and buttons that you make uh, might work in a similar way online it's a really good way of sharing jojo's resources desmos obviously does something similar and with more power behind it in the activity builder but the the thing I wanted to show everyone is it, it's dead easy. Once you've logged in, just click create and you can either build an activity live in the website and the web version of GeoGebra, or you can just upload a file, uh, a GeoGebra file that you have saved in the, the classic downloaded versions. And it is that easy. And once it's up there, you can embed it all over the place. And that I think is what Becky posted. We had a, a really nice demonstration of one that is, did Becky, did you post it? I don't know if Becky's still here. Um, so here's, here's the Enrich site, and here's a GeoGebra applet embedded in a website. And once it's stored on the online thing in GeoGebra, you can sort of reference it from another website. And so this is fully interactive. You can uh, play the guessing game here. I'm trying to guess an angle of 51 degrees, which is there. 48, not bad. Uh, but this is a fully interactive thing designed in GeoGebra without the need to sort of code it from scratch in JavaScript or something. So you can get a pretty good level of functionality without the coding. I'm going to stop talking because I could go on all day about this, and I shouldn't. I don't know how to stop talking. How do I? How do I ah. Someone has asked if we could please demonstrate recording of actions and automatic conversion to script, if possible. Wow. In what context is that, David? Uh, if you are talking, David, your mic is muted. I mean, if you are, you aren't talking. Um, I know that when I used to create interactive spreadsheets, so decades ago, no, years ago, um, to actually begin with um, a working uh, spreadsheet um, that didn't look like a spreadsheet, yeah. I'd actually get the system to record what I was doing. Yeah. Um, and it didn't record it um, as a set of recognizable actions it recorded the the underlying visual basic that corresponded to those actions i just wondered what i would do in um, in another package say another package such as geogebra so i guess to clarify this if anyone else is um confused i think you're talking about excel you could record what they called a macro by sort of literally pressing a record thing doing a thing with your mouse and typing and then stopping recording and it had saved the actions that you'd created manually as a sort of automatic script is that a fair summary mm. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and that is incredibly useful and almost like programming by do what I do, please, but do it automatically. Um, and Excel is somewhat unique in that. The, I guess working with, say, Desmos or Jojbra is learning about how the interactivity is functionally built into the commands. So you don't have to say, Jojbra, copy what I'm doing now. You build it so that it's draggable. It's a different way of thinking, though. So, um, and I think of, you can you can build your own tools in GeoGebra. So GeoGebra can. has a perpendicular bisector tool, for example, but you can create your own perpendicular bisector tool by um, sort of making a construction um, and and then defining that as a template for a new tool. Which that's is absolutely correct. Not, not it, quite what you're asking for, but yeah, but, maybe but it is the closest. There. And it's not so much a recording as more if you've built something, you can then automate that build by saying, "I built this from these bots." make a tool for it so it is possible um it's less useful in judgment because a lot of the interactivity 
it's sort of built in by a command. I mean, it's quite a nice thought, actually. It hadn't even point, really Christian. occurred to me. I'm, I'm sure I've done this kind of thing before, but actually spreadsheets are quite a nice example of a thing that people can play with themselves, um, especially if you're working with a group that also could do with learning how to use Excel. <laughs> you know, yeah. like that's, that's a skill in itself that you might want to teach people. But like, you know, certainly our uni students, we teach them Excel and VBA, so they know how to do a bit of coding with an Excel spreadsheet. But at school level, they will be learning how to use that software. Um, and if you can give them a downloadable spreadsheet that's got kind of things set up, you can set it so that only certain cells are editable. You can do lots of clever things with formatting. Um, you could create, you know, with basic Excel, Excel skills, quite a nice interactive, you know, worksheet for people to play with and, you know, solve math problems and that kind of thing. And that's something they could download from a website or you could even use something like Google Sheets so that it's there and, and online for people to use on there. I know quite a few teachers who use um, uh, Google uh, Slides in classrooms and they put the name at the top of every slide. Every student has their own slides and then they can use that slide to uh, create things, solve problems, do whatever, but then look at what everyone else is doing at the same time and comment That's on that. Nice. And uh, Photoshop, by the way, has exactly the same record functionality as Excel and uh, it's been very useful in my experience. So if there's a, a thing you need to do repeatedly, you record yourself doing it once and then press the... Yeah, or the, or, the, or the you button. can download certain pre-built actions that yeah. add certain effects or whatever. I guess what we're glimpsing is the power of writing a script, whether it's in Visual Basic or in JavaScript or basically JoJibra. Yeah, something that is useful for all of us. I mean, this is this is free chat. So if anyone else wants to pick up on a topic we sort of glossed over earlier, feel free to bring that back or any. Zoe had any a question as well. Um, how does Philip the link that you shared is that the link that the students need, and how does a teacher set a challenge for students and access their dashboard with student responses? Um, you've shared a few links. This, I'm assuming this is in Desmos, I assume. So if you um, go to the Desmos website, you can log in as a teacher, um, and then you can either create your own activity, or they have hundreds of pre-built activities. You can either copy um, as they are, or mi mix and match between different activities. And um, when you click, I, I think you can click play or start one of these activities, you get a class code, which is um, four or five letters or numbers. And you can share that code with um, your students. Then the students go to the Desmos website, enter the code. Um, they can either log in with an account or just stay anonymous. And in real time, you see what students are doing. And it's incredibly powerful. So you can line up 20 different screens or activities you want to use for an entire lesson or, or workshop, but you can uh, tell students to go to one specific screen. You can lock screens that students can't do whatever they want. Um, and uh, you, you see their data coming in real time. That's perfect. Thank you. I found it. It is possible that in a future session, we should cover things like spreadsheets, Desmos, GeoGebra, Autograph as, as a sort of an overview of mathematical tools that are, you know, relatively new in the grand scheme of things in a, in a session like this. But if you're interested in that sort of thing, then give us some feedback. Yeah, I think potentially beyond the initial run of six sessions, which we, we're sort of thinking about trying to make them as general as possible so that they're useful to a lot of people. But it may be that if we say, we're just going to have an hour on GeoGebra um, at this time. You know, people can take it or leave it. If that's not something they're interested yeah. in. Um, it may be that we can run some more sessions kind of later on, maybe at different times of the week as well, so that people can be more flexible, um, you know, when, whenever people are available. That would be a really nice thing to do. And I think, so we've got um, a session about learning new skills that might also turn up some suggestions for sessions like that as well. Um, but we'll try and maintain a, a list of ideas for that kind of thing. If you want to drop us an email, we are info at talkingmathsinpublic.uk um, or you can, you know, drop things in the chat now. We will try and collate these kinds of ideas for, for future potential sessions like this because we are, yeah, the, Ben's put, put the email address in the chat. If you wanted to just make a note of that and write something a bit more involved, if you've got serious ideas, uh, we're happy to take on suggestions like that. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd personally find that useful. Um, 
one thing I'll add as well in, in terms of the more general stuff is do also look at places like Virtually Social that Jamie, who was with us last week, runs. There's He'll have had different sessions on different topics um, and he tends to film the, the speakers for that and put them up online and things like that. So they're, they're useful places to go as well. And there was a comment earlier in the um, in the chat about how to get things developed, and, and that was uh, you you can if you're friendly with your local computer science department, then you can get student projects to, to try things, um, and and certainly I've tried in the past to get my students to do to do things, um, get them online and get them interactive, but uh, generally math students don't have the the necessary skills to. Um, you kind of had to teach them so but anyway yes uh, that's that's a good good place to get it uh, and James Arthur is, is, is saying um, if you need any help with web web dev stuff uh, he's more than happy to help there we go I guess it's worth reiterating what Christian kind of eventually admitted to when we coaxed him is that if you have a project and you know someone who might be able to build it it's, it's not a problem to ask them if they're interested in their job I, I'm speaking for Christian perhaps but like he'll say no if he doesn't want to do it right <laughs> but he might say yes i mean and i have said no in the past yeah yeah <laughs> but i mean it is a learning curve and if you if you need a sort of shiny polished product that can take too long to mm. climb the curve and get the product out at the same time and so there's a balance between learning to do it yourself so if you want i mean mathigon is full of the, the shiny polished versions that that Philip spent a long time making look amazing, but it takes a long time to get a homemade thing looking like that and with all the aesthetic details. So I think just being aware that tinkering yourself is necessary, but also going to ask someone to polish something might also be necessary. And don't be afraid to ask someone like me or Christian or Philip if yeah. if you need. There was um, there's something I meant to mention but didn't, which is that. Um, uh, polishing something there, there are two aspects of it there's making it look nice and fun to interact with but there's also you've got to think about everything that somebody could do with yeah. it yeah um yeah um and i didn't show the thing to do with that where it shows a splitting a number into three palindromes um and you really have to think about what is somebody going to type into this box can i really cope with all of these cases um, um so that's quite important and can be quite a lot of work um and could put you off publishing something because you're not because uh, there'll be cases where it just breaks um so you have to think yeah i mean it depends how many uh, emails you prepared to field from people going well i did this and and then you go thank you very much for your input i will fix that one now uh, like if you're happy to put something out initially that that does you know 90 percent of people uh, and then maybe don't tell any mathematicians about it until You've, you've had some normal people look at it and then, then let the mathematicians loose on it and they will find all of those edge cases and break it in all the possible ways. Uh, so yeah, that is one best, use of mathematicians. The best thing to do is, is to put it out and other people will find the problems for you. Mm. One thing to bear in mind with stuff like that is don't uh, necessarily, you can definitely ask people, but also ask them how much it will cost because mm. just like we've seen with a lot of artists, these, this is people's skill, it's people's time. Um, as willing as people are to help you with stuff, it might be that if you're asking them to build you a whole thing, that's an awful lot of work for them. So yeah, expect. I guess I meant, I, did, I didn't make that clear, but that, I wasn't saying, just go to Christian with all your free projects that he can't get any income for. <laughs> yeah. No, well, this, it's, this is a thing, isn't it? Because it's a, it's a skill that people have spent time developing. And if yeah. you're prepared to learn a skill yourself, then you can do your own stuff and, and do whatever. But yeah, I'm, I'm sure, you know, people are lovely and I'm sure they're happy to give advice. But if anything does involve a serious amount of work, you know, pay contributors. That's a good message. Um, one thing, Katie, you were mentioning earlier about how you've started contributing a little bit towards uh, Mathagon with Philip. And I wondered how you found that in terms of, because you, you were saying about how you've, it's just not just the process of here's a nice thing. It's the how people interact with it and, and things like that, that you've had to think through. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's definitely kind of, it's different to just writing a blog post about something. I guess, because that's, you know, something else that I also do. And, you know, like, here's an interesting bit of maths. Here's how it all works. Here's some stuff to do with it. Here are some nice examples. Uh, and that's great if someone's kind of just going to read it and, you know, engage with it on that level. Um, but I think a lot of the things that Philip's built into Mathagon are designed to, as he said, tell a story and kind of take people through and engage them at each stage. And um, so quite often you have to kind of stop and say, okay, 
I kind of want to check that they've understood what I've just said. I'm going to make them fill in this couple of blanks. And until they've done that, they can't see the next bit. Um, sort of it, it kind of builds gradually. So it allows you to do that kind of process of, of sort of ha holding hands with the students a little bit, but also kind of making sure that they're with you on everything. Um, and in the process of writing this stuff, I've had to not necessarily change what I was going to say, but think about how I can phrase it and how I can structure it such that it's got that kind of progression through it. And also, you know, how much I put into each section, you kind of want them to all be roughly equal in size so that it's not just like a huge blank passage of text that they have to read. Uh, you know, you want there to be something interactive going on every so often. Um, and it also does make you think about what you're talking about and, you know, actually, is this even interesting? Why am I bothering describing this if it's just some boring stuff? You know, like, do I want to put something more engaging here instead or, or put in a nice example or, or give them something that they can play with a little bit? Um, and that's also a nice thing about Mathigon is that sometimes there doesn't have to be like an answer to the question you're asking. It can just be like, you know, here's some Penrose tiles or whatever, have a bit of a play, you know, see what you can do with it because that in itself is, is engagement. Like Christian was saying, you know, just presenting something that is in itself interesting. Um, kind of raises questions in their minds, which you maybe then go on to answer in, in the rest of it. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's sort of similar to the process of designing a workshop, except that I'm not there. So you kind of have to, uh, and again, you have to cover all the bases in terms of how people could misinterpret what you said or, or think about it differently as well. Yeah, it's a good challenge. Yeah, one uh, of the things, sorry. Go ahead, Sam. No, I was changing the topic slightly, so carry on, Philip. Uh, me too. I wanted to say uh, one website we haven't mentioned yet is the Wolfram Demonstrations Project. And um, I, I think for most topics in mathematics, if there's something interactive you want to do, you will find something on there or on the GeoGebra website that does something similar to what you want. Um, so uh, in many cases, you don't have to build something from scratch. There are lots of free resources um, on the internet that you can use. And going back to one of the earlier topics um, regarding polishing, uh, I just want to warn people that it takes so much more time than you expect. And there are so many things you've not thought about, like making sure that a website works on your phone on a really tiny screen, or if you use a finger rather than um, a cursor or really old browsers. Um, th there are, you need a privacy policy if you want to collect any sorts of data. And there are so many legal hurdles to, to jump through. So uh, that takes uh, a lot of time as a warning, but uh, like uh, Alison and others have said, you don't really need that in most cases. What I was going to say, that's, that's really helpful. Um, what I was going to talk about was, was what some of the things we were thinking about when we were thinking about making our workshops online and interactive. Um, it was something I was, I was really quite excited about because it's not just for now it's for you know future when we're working with groups that are really remote and things like that um but it's what you lose by being online compared to being in person so it's it's that instant response of of that that have they understood this do i need to do this in a different way that sort of thing but it's also especially in a lot of my sessions it's a lot of discussion and how do you do that when there are kids on their own at home so we were thinking about it slightly differently for primary and secondary. So primary, you've got kids, but they'll need an adult to have logged them onto a thing and to be using their device and things like that. So there'll probably be someone nearby that they can talk to. Secondary, not so much. And we were coming up with all sorts of ways of thinking, you know, how do we, how do we still get them to think about and, and do discussion and things like that? Because it's, particularly if they're watching it in their own time there isn't necessarily someone who's logged on at the same time who they can have a, a chat with about this thing and, and do that so it's coming up with with lots of ideas of of what they could do for that discussion is it going to be get them to brainstorm for two minutes say you know pause this video for two minutes have a brainstorm and then here are some of the things you might have thought of or um showing things that you've you've come up from so one of my sessions I have run for the past, I don't know, six years. So I know what the kids usually say and I can say, this is what's been said in previous classes or whatever. But there's other stuff where you're, the whole point of the discussion is to getting different points of view in. And one of the things we did with I'm a scientist a couple of years ago, and I think since it wasn't me, it was someone else. Um, we did discussion packs debate packs that was it with them and it was different points of view in the packs 
and I was sort of wondering if there was ways you could like, well, so-and-so thinks this and so-and-so thinks that and then get them to try and engage with that sort of thing in one, some way. Again, it, it never actually happened yet. So um, it's still a sort of half formed idea, but yeah, it was a big part of what we were thinking about was how people could access and how people could come up with those sorts of discussion replacement things if they're on their own. But yeah, I don't know if anyone's got any thoughts or feedback on that. No, that's interesting. Fran, is that a hand or a? It is a hand. It, it wasn't a stretch. Stretches go off the screen. <laughs> um, it was only uh, actually uh, Alison had shared with me this morning a thing called. She says checking back in her notes. Hang on. Um, oh, I've lost it now. Oh, whiteboard.fi. And um, I haven't explored it much yet, but I've had a bit of a play, and it seems to be a screen that you, as a teacher, can use and that like Desmos is linking in with a code to a classroom that, that children or whoever's in your classroom can see and that the um, child themselves, so I've had a fun morning playing between my laptop and my phone, phone is the child and laptop is me, um, and that the, the child can, uh, or whoever's using it, can put things on their own whiteboard, um, which the teacher can see and you can then send things out from your teacher to everyone simultaneously. So although you have view of every individual one, you could then share that in different ways. And I did a session the other day where, um, a bit like you were saying, Sam, I was hoping that the 65, 70 trainee teachers who were virtually online were going to contribute through the chat, but I couldn't definitely guarantee this. So I'd written down some things that I was used to hearing. Um, and so, uh, you know, I couldn't fake the chat because they'd have seen I was just making up that people weren't saying what I said they were saying. But you can do in sessions usually when it's live. And it occurred to me that the whiteboard.fi might allow you to do that so that you could say, oh, I have seen somebody very interestingly has a well actually they haven't got view of everybody so you sending it out not entirely you know kind of moral perhaps but very useful as a technique to be able to say I'd like you to think about this now and that's how I'm going to share it with you and it, if it feels like it comes from the room if I'm walking a room where I'm actually presenting with people you can do that all the time nobody knows that it might be coming from your head from a plan of something that you know goes well if you do it like this nobody's ever going to trust me in a real life session anymore ever again but um but it's a, it, it feels better if it comes organically from those people who you're trying to engage and I wondered if electronically that might be one way of doing it that's a really good point and it's a really good technique in live events don't be afraid of faking a very useful provocative response um, mass inspiration does it well with their question box which people put questions on bits of paper during the interval and then matt will go and process it and read out questions that haven't been planted in by the speakers at all but but you can also get genuine ones and i think that's a really good example of looking for ways to do that on an online resource so whiteboard fi or any other way where you can uh sort of source contributions from the class anonymously is pretty helpful that's good it's so, google surveys and and asking them to send you a private message with questions in as well would possibly yeah. work um just with half an eye on time uh it'd be it'd be nice to kind of wrap up by half past it all I, I could do this all day but i'm sure that people may need to go and do the things um so a lot of the links and things that people have talked about have gone in the chat. Uh, we've we linked to a document earlier. Um, again, it's one of these things that is free for anyone to edit. So we'll, we'll leave it open for editing for a little while. So if there's anything people want to add in there, that's fab. Uh, I realize that in practice that doesn't always happen very much, but we're going to try and collate the links that have gone in today um, and a little bit of a, de a description for each one. Um, so that'll become a hopefully useful collection of resources for this kind of thing as well. Um, so if you have got anything to add to that, the link's just gone in there again, uh, if you want to do that. Yeah, there's not much in there at the moment. It's just a blank document. So please do add stuff in as you think of it. All right, then. Um, While people are still here, then maybe can we have another thank you for Christian and Philip and Michaela, who's also already gone. But uh, thank you very much really helpful input from you both and from from Michaela as well yes thank you so much it's been really useful to to just see some of your stuff and to hear how it works and things like that um, has been really nice I think a lot of particularly Philip's stuff when you were going through a lot of those are topics I was thinking of for workshops that were going to be a thing at some point and I'm looking at it going 
Ooh, there's that interactive. Ooh, there's that interactive. <laughs> Um, I'm working on a workshop for MoMath next week on graph theory, and we're trying to sort of work out how we can uh, incorporate some of these interactive elements. So I'll send you some links afterwards, maybe, if you're interested. Excellent. Thank you.